thank you, thank you, Mr. Berman, thank for you. you know taking time out. Pleasure. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is uh, the ninth edition of the Indian Marketing Awards, and Mr. Berman has been kind enough this year to chair the jury. And as many of you know, who participated in the award show earlier, it requires considerable time and effort and sort of you know deep effort. Uh, what we'll do is, uh, you know, in the course of this conversation, uh, uh, we'll pick up kind of, you know, two buckets. As you heard from Khyati, Mr. Burman is a multifaceted personality. His name is, you know, more associated with uh, what's happening in uh, Dabur, India. But at the same time, you know, there is a large universe outside of Dabur that he's curated and, you know, he drives very passionately, which includes, you know, his investment in IPL, which includes, you know, some of the recent things he's done like, you know, uh, acquisition of Everity and uh, many other things. So, what we'll do is we'll sort of center this conversation around, you know, one piece which is Dabur and, you know, what's happening in the larger FMCG ecosystem and the other piece about, you know, what is Mohit Burman doing outside of, you know, Dabur and, you know, uh, the things that he's driving. So, thank you, Mr. Burman again and uh, welcome to this fireside. Thank you, everyone. I, uh, I wanted to start by asking you, you know, last two years, three years, I've been sort of action-packed for the entire FMCG industry, uh, especially COVID. And as we come out of COVID, you've made some acquisitions, you've uh, done investments. Uh, if you were to look at, you know, what are the new things that we can expect from Dabur in the next, say, 24 to 36 uh, months, what would some of those look like? Yeah. So, if you look at um, the, the company as such, I mean, you know, we've been around for 130 years. So, two years is a very short time span to discuss what we're going to be doing. But historically, the business was started as an Ayurvedic company in Calcutta in 1884. I'm the fifth generation. So, the idea was to make Ayurvedic products to serve the middle and the lower class with, with medicines uh, which were affordable. And um, over the years, as it became professionalized and we listed the business, it became a more mainstream FMCG company. So we started to compete with the likes of the Levers and the PNGs and the other big Indian multinationals. So there was a lot of emphasis on newer product categories and there was a lot of emphasis on, on, on growth. So what actually happened was that we started to get into sectors which in, in some way, we had lost uh, inherent strength, which was Ayurveda. So, over the last few years, as, as, as Naval has mentioned, uh, with this whole uh, outbreak of COVID, um, our portfolio of our healthcare business has been growing uh, phenomenally. Of course, you know, we, we've been trying to take the products of our portfolio because, of course, Dabur has an old Ayurvedic heritage. We have 500 odd products, but it's always the same 30 or 40 that people talk about. And the whole idea was that during COVID, we were able to identify product categories that were essential for the actual, um, for COVID and for making the, or making it easier for uh, families uh, to uh, to cope with the uh, the inherent um, COVID sort of um, um, medicines. So we we are focused more on healthcare. We've taken a lot of our Ayurvedic products and and identified them and made them more mainstream, given them brands. And uh, I think uh, I think over the next few years we're going to be focusing on on a lot on our healthcare business. Uh, and uh, not to say that our personal care business or our foods business will be will take a background, will be in the background, but that healthcare business will grow a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think we, have, uh, you know, given that Dabur is fully homegrown, uh, it has been at the forefront of innovation when it comes to you know doing product extensions. Uh, even the you know recent acquisition of Bacha Masala, and we'll come to that you know in due course of time. How does it dovetail into the larger Dabur strategy? But let me also, you know, beyond the products that you're looking to do, what are the larger things? Because I think uh, a few uh, things that are, you know, happening in the larger ecosystem of the economy and how that is impacting all consumer products companies is also important to bear in mind while you talk about how you, you know, look at the future. So, for example, sustainability has become a, you know, very big theme for, you know, a large number of companies. Uh, you talk about, you know, you know, a greener future, uh, how the entire D2C sort of ecosystem is impacting 
you know, brick and mortar, legacy, legacy companies, that's also become an extremely, you know, challenging. So, what are the, some of the things that you're doing across these, you know, two, three pillars to kind of drive growth and, you know, what you're going to do in the future? Yeah. So, I mean, very important. I think a lot of companies are moving towards, you know, being, uh, adding a lot in the sustainability area. I mean, in Dabur, you know, we have these initiatives in the plastic because, as you know, all FMCG companies have a lot of plastic uh, wastage. We are, we are, we're doing a lot in terms of, uh, um, you know, taking our plastic uh, waste and making it positive. We are actually, um, uh, you know, now moving our logistics towards more EVs and uh, and uh, we are we're insisting that uh, all the uh, logistics as well as our deliveries are done on electric vehicles. We're doing some stuff in the in the in the water positive area. So I think as 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 an FMCG company, whatever we can. I mean, you know, obviously in our business, it's. Uh, I mean, you're not uh, the wastage is not like a cement or steel business. So we're doing whatever we can in terms of uh, supporting uh, the uh, the greener initiatives. On the D2C, as you mentioned, a lot of businesses have realized that uh, now the direct-to-consumer with the new e-commerce arena, with a lot of uh, success stories like you've seen Nike, we, uh, we need to reach out directly to the consumer. We're setting, uh, and as I mentioned uh, on my, just a few minutes ago, that Dabur's portfolio is huge and, you know, it's very difficult most for most customers to really understand the diverse range that we carry so there'll be a double shop where not only will you be able to buy the products but you'll also be able to see the whole range so it's not only 10 or 20 products that are available in amazon but you will be able to see all the different product categories that were in you know historically um, you know being a old um, you know company from the 1800s it was always a br brick and mortar yeah, areas that we are focused on, but uh, as Naval has said, you know, with the innovation now that uh, a lot of uh, new companies are bringing up, uh, we realize the importance of the D2C. We, uh, we, we have health and beauty shops, uh, which is uh, which uh, we are expanding, but we're going to be moving that into e-commerce. So those shops don't only sell Davul products; they actually sell a, b a range of health and beauty products, and. Um, Although we did the brick and mortar before we did the e-commerce, I suppose it's still not too late. So that's where we're going to be heading. Yeah, I think that's uh, D2C in many ways presents both significant challenges as well as opportunities for brick and mortar businesses across industries. And I think FMCG is a sector that has kind of, you know, taken to it faster. Uh, we've had so many success stories in the D2C space uh, in the last few years in India. And I think brick and mortar companies have been very quick to realize for those of you who might be interested, you know, Dabur is launching its own kind of D2C, yeah. you know, full-fledged, uh, you know, 360 degree play where all products are available online, delivered to you. Un unlike the e-commerce piece where, you know, there's limited range available, limited product availability, here you have the whole thing, you know, uh, available at uh, one place. Let me come to, uh, Mr. Burman, the acquisition of, you know, Bacha Masala, the you know, significant stake you acquired in the company. Again, that's a, you know, legacy brand. It's a very well-known, established, you know, Indian uh, brand. What is the philosophy behind the acquisition and, you know, how do you see that yeah. dovetailing into, you know, Dower's course business? Because as you yourself mentioned, healthcare and personal care are the two pillars of, you know, uh, you know, Dabur's business. Yeah. So, um, we do have a third pillar, which is food and beverages. Obviously, not as big as the other two, but as you all may know, we manufacture fruit juices under the brand name Real. And, um, of course, um, um, the spice category has been uh, in the news for quite some time. Uh, um, it's a big category, 25,000 crore uh, organized market, another 25,000 crore unorganized market. No, na very few national players the spice business, you know, changes for the taste changes from uh, each state, and uh, I think barring maybe one or two national players, all the others are regional players. So the basic idea here was to get into a category. You know, we probably didn't have the research and development to do it ourselves. So we did uh, we did an acquisition of a regional player called Bacha, which is very strong in Gujarat and Maharashtra. And the whole idea behind that is to to take this uh, to take this category and to make it a national um, um, you know player 
Now it may, it may just sound that easy, but obviously it's not because for uh, for every state uh, we uh, we're going to have to able to, we're going to be able to you know test market what type of taste preferences and what type of spices need to be sold. Now I mean on its own I don't think Dabo would have uh, it would have probably taken us maybe 10 or 20 years to do it. So we so it's a strong brand. The idea is that uh, it's got its research and development. Darbur can add uh, value by taking the uh, business national, uh, strong distribution, and uh, I think between the two, uh, we should be able to make it a success. Yeah, I think from a distribution point of view also, it beautifully dovetails into, yeah. you know, where sort of, you know, Darbur sits today. Let me ask you a little bit about, you know, the larger FMCG mm. space and, uh, you know, what's happening. Uh, we've seen, you know, COVID again was very challenging for all sectors. FMCG in many ways was, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a category. FMCG is a very large category, but many segments within FMCG are essential products. So you know, products kept selling, uh, the distribution was challenging. But as we have come out of COVID, and you know, we've seen the kind of growth trends of the last two three years. Uh, what would you nail down as the challenges for the FMCG business, say, you know, 12, 24 months into the future? What are the few few things you think will occupy a lot of space? of mind for, you know, CEOs and MDs of FMCG companies? You know, I mean, I don't think it's specific to Dabur, but I, the whole industry is, uh, you know, facing headwinds uh, at the moment, mainly because of inflation uh, and uh, down trading. Um, uh, you know, cost of, uh, the cost of raw material, packaging material, uh, you know, oil prices, you know, I've taken... Uh, the prices of all our raw materials up, and you know this is all throughout the FMCG industry. And you know, obviously, being in, the, in a very price-sensitive, competitive industry, there's no way you can pass on these products to the uh, uh, to the consumer. Um, therefore, what happens is that you've got to absorb most of that, so your margins get hit. Then you know you start you start cutting on um, you know things like advertising, and uh, and uh, it makes makes you a little bit more um, agile. But uh, I think uh, that is the that is the biggest headwind where all FMCG companies are facing. Also, um, in terms of uh, uh, you know when that happens, then people start down trading. It may be they may go if if you've got a very strong product, uh, they may go for a smaller size. Or they may go, they may they may go to a competitor's product, which is at a at a at a lower cost. So I mean that's that's something which will happen too. So I think uh, over the next 12, 24 months, uh, those are the major issues we're going to have to face with. Yes. Also, given that you know so much, I think 40 percent of sales of some of the categories come from the hinterland, and income growth really is you know directly correlated to what's happening and especially for the mass product, you know, the uptake. I was talking to Mr. Puri in the last session we had, and he was telling me about how some of the sort of higher price products are not so impacted by, you know, what's happening in the larger economy, but the products which are at the entry level or lower price ones, you know, get impacted. Uh, so let me now kind of move away. As I mentioned at the beginning, you know, Mr. Burman is a multifaceted personality, you know, dabbles in a lot of things. Dabur is, you know, one aspect of his life. Uh, recently, as we know, uh, he also picked up stake in Everready, and which is a interesting, very interesting thing. The commonality is both are, you know, Dabur started from Calcutta, Everready continues to be based in uh, Calcutta. Outside of that, what's the logic behind it and, you know, what is the play going forward? Yeah, but first of all, let me answer your question about being multifaceted. You know, we had a, we, uh, about 20 years ago, we had a, um, a sort of a family, um, uh, dynamic where we had McKinsey come in and basically, uh, you know, we sorted out. Uh, uh, so we put uh, we put uh, a kind of family charter where family members aren't allowed to have executive roles into the company. So um, obviously, each one has managed to find their way. But as a family, we're together. But we keep on looking at opportunities. So coming back to the exact opportunity, you're ever ready again? Consumer business, old brand heritage, strong, very strong distribution. Uh, you know, has had uh, you know uh, promoter problems or whatever. I mean, I, so there, it was an opportunity, and uh, as I and you know, we we we've uh, recently acquired, taken control, and um, and um, you know, the idea is to really put um, the right people to run the business and uh, and to see what product uh, categories we can get into. So we've got Bain uh, doing a five-year strategy. We've got we've hired. Uh, you know, three or four top management, you know, and done, the, done a similar thing we've done in Dabur, whereas we've, uh, 
you know, incentivize them with, with stock options and, uh, and hopefully in the next few years we'll be able to put this business back into track. But the whole idea, and you know, it's quite, um, um, it's, 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 uh, it's how Naval just mentioned, it's, it's like from a, from a company which has had promoters sitting there 365 days a year uh, telling them what to do. Now you have a promoter only comes in maybe once a quarter and listens to the reviews and does a board meeting. And I think, uh, you know, we've been successful in doing that in Dabur is to make sure that uh, everyone's aligned, uh, the board, the management, um, and uh, to make sure that everyone is uh, incentivized to, to perform. And, you know, of course, there, there are a lot of other success stories and, you know, some in this room. Um, so um, I think uh, it works for us when there are a lot of family members. Fantastic. Let me come to your sort of most famous persona now, which is, you know, IPL. Uh, you know, you've curated the team and you've now run it successfully for, you know, IPL has completed 15 years. Uh, there are various aspects to, you know, uh, his involvement in IPL. Uh, the latest one being, as many of you would know, he picked up the most expensive player in IPL, which is Sam Curran. Uh, and, uh, you know, Punjab Kings has had, you know, many successful seasons in the last few years. Uh, one of the burning questions people in the media business ask these days, you know, uh, what about these media rights? They've gone through the roof, you know, uh, Star, uh, Disney paid 16,000 crores for a, you know, five-year ride cycle. And now if, now if you combine what Viacom and Disney has paid between them, it is almost three times. It's, a, I mean, roughly 48,000 crores and a bit. Uh, though as a team owner, you stand to immensely benefit from it because that money comes into the central pool and you earn it. But what is view, or your view on, you know, the inflation in pricing? I won't ask you a, you know, black and white question whether, you know, the no. price will justify. But at the same time, what's your sort of nuanced view? What do you think has led to this kind of astronomical increase in yeah. pricing. And then, you know, what are these rights owners going to do to kind of earn that? Yeah, so just, I mean, let me take you all quickly back 15 years ago. When IPL started, first of all, no one knew what, what was going on or what, what we were doing, okay? I mean, the first year, we were, we were one of the first ones to buy a team. I, I have other partners, as you may know, Preeti and Ness and Karan, but uh, the, the, first, the first couple of years, we couldn't even get one sponsor. Everyone said this isn't going to work. You know, people go to watch India, Pakistan, or the, the Ashes, this ain't going to work. We couldn't even get one sponsor. At that time, the media rights was even very low. Uh, the player costs were huge, administration costs were huge. We didn't know how to manage the businesses. Every, every IPL team kept on bleeding for six, seven years. You had a couple of fallouts, you know, two or three people, you know, went bust, two or three got banned. Then, and then on, from the seventh year, we were, we were uh, one of the first ones to make money. And why we made money is because I never used to spend my whole purse on players. But then there's always a, you know, a knock on effect. You don't spend money on players, then the coach says you don't spend money on players, how do you expect us to win? Then, the, then, then my CEOs here says if you don't win, how do you expect us to get sponsors? So it's a vicious cycle. On, then on the 10th year, after, after you know, kind of breaking even, the media rights went up to a different level. That's when people started to get a little bit more confident because in the first 10 years, 50% of our uh, income used to come from the media rights, which is actually not even in our control. It comes to BCCI, they keep some and they split the rest between us. Then in the 10th year, that 50% went to 70%. So then... You know, the other sort of revenue streams like ticket, merchandising, all started to take a little bit of a, you know, uh, we became more confident. The, spo the sponsorship started to go up. If you, looked at the, if you looked at the first 10 years, it was mainly the big brick and mortar businesses that were advertising, all the big brands, you know, of the old, all the old businesses. Then, then you started, then when the media rights went up, then, of course, the people who bought the, the, the channels that bought the media rights had to put up their prices. The brick and mortar stuff, businesses started to leave because it didn't make sense for them. Then you started to get the startups advertising who were spending a lot of money and wanted to be noticed straight away. Now, so you had this thing like, you had this 10-year curve, then suddenly it goes like this, then it goes five, then now in the last year it went up again substantially. So what happens is, like you said, it's great for, it's great for, it's great for IPL uh, teams because, you know, it's uh, now 80% of our money is, is fixed. So it's like an annuity. So, of course, you know, we're, we're happy, we're laughing all the way to the bank. Don't forget that most of the people who started are not there anymore. So we did, 
but what actually happens is that you have these media companies, you know, who can afford to pay these sort of sums. But what happens is then the advertising rates go sky high. Now, I don't know, I, I mean, at these rates, you know, of course, it's a, it's a proven category now, it's a proven product, so when IPL happens, no movies get launched, the whole world is, uh, you know, watching. So. There will still be takers, but it's going to get more and more expensive. Absolutely. But I, I think one of the premises of, you know, uh, the bids that have gone is also that how do, especially company like Reliance, earn from, say, selling more data to their consumers. So, not just advertising revenue, but also no. data as we know, you know, I mean, each match, I'm told, is roughly 3 to 4 GB of sort of data consumption. Yeah. Multiplied by close to 100 matches. If you want to watch even part of IPL, that's a lot of data yeah. required. So, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, G Giro and Star would have a game plan. Uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, I hear that, you know, they're going to be giving streaming for free, but I read somewhere that, you know, as you mentioned, that, you know, the data that they're going to make money on, on actually for customers to watch. I don't know how many people watch a whole three-hour game on a, on a phone. I mean, I would think that's pretty difficult. But... Um, um, you know, uh, it would be difficult for me to answer how these guys are going to monetize it. But, you know, two companies owning it, this is the first time uh, after 15 years of IPL having been in existence, two different companies owning media rights and I think, uh, you know, team owners are not complaining for sure. Hmm. We've also seen what's happened with the women's uh, IPL, the media rights and, you know, other parts of women's IPL, team sales and so on. So really pricing for all things cricket has significantly gone up. I'm getting my cue to, you know, end this session as we have a long award ceremony after this. One last question sure. for you, Mr. Burman, before we take a couple yeah. of questions from the audience. What is your leadership style? You know, you, you dabble in so many things. Naturally, there is a trade-off you look to do every day between, you know, how much you want to sort of get into detailing and do a deep dive versus how much do you want to delegate at the same time be in. And every leader has a different style yeah. of working. So, what, what is the kind of approach you follow? Well, you know, I mean, in the beginning, if I'm involved in a business that needs more attention, you know, the one gets it. But the whole idea is, as I said, you know, you have to, you have to identify the right people to, uh, to, to be heading the businesses. I mean, you know, we, I'm lucky that uh, we, have, we have businesses that have been around for a long time and I'm able to, you know, get resources from there and, and get help from there. But, um, you know, especially if it's a new business, we have a large uh, QSR business. You know, we, we run uh, uh, a master franchise of an American brand called Taco Bell. You know, obviously, it's it's a business. Uh, my brother and I started a few years ago. It's we are not in the in the food retailing business, so that that takes. So for us, that that's a learning curve. You know, IPL was a learning curve. You know, with things like everybody, it's much easier because you know I'm able to replicate. Uh, you know, the the sort of uh, the 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 Darbo kind of um, situation there. So it really depends on uh, on what. Uh, or what type of businesses I want to do and what I want to anchor. But uh, his, historically, we focus on, on consumer healthcare. Fantastic. Thank you so much for you know, a candid conversation. I'd like a big round of applause for Mr. Thank Berman. You.